Welcome, everybody. Uh, you guys can come on in. There's plenty of seats over here. Um, my name is Amanda Silver. I'm the Director of Program Management for Visual Studio. My team works on the core of the Visual Studio platform, um, as well as any of the tools related to building the client side of your application. So that includes a Windows application, all of the XAML tools, as well as a client portion of a web application. So for example, the TypeScript tools, uh, as well as cross-platform mobile apps. So I've been working with the Xamarin team for the last couple of years a lot, um, as well as working on the tools for Apache Cordova. <coughs> I'm really excited to be able to talk to you guys today about our vision for the future of Visual Studio. We have a lot of really passionate people back in Redmond who have a deep commitment to developer productivity. And they're constantly trying to figure out how to make your life better as a developer. Personally, I've been on the developer tools team since 2001. So I've basically made it my career to work on developer tools. And it's been so exciting every year to have something brand new to be able to work on. Every year, it's absolutely different. Um, but I'm st I've still been working on Visual Studio and all of our developer platform for, since, for all that time. Um, so I'm personally very, very committed to it. <clears throat> We're passionate about developers because we believe in the power and the potential that you guys hold for your businesses. Developers enable organizations to succeed, period. They're what allow businesses to connect with their customers more easily. And it's you guys who make our future brighter. Our goal at Microsoft is to provide developers with a platform and tools that will make them incredibly successful. <clears throat> it's a mission that we've had since the inception of our company, which is one of the reasons that it's such an honor to work on the tools. You'll see today how we're trying to deliver flexible, powerful tools that will allow you to build any kind of application. We're delivering all of these tools with an open approach. You can use our tools to target any platform. You guys know you can target Windows with Visual Studio. You can also target Android and iOS. We've obviously talked a lot about that. You can also target a back-end uh, Linux. We also talked about that today as well. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Another thing that you'll see today is that we're really focused on improving your experience to learn from and contribute to code in the open domain. The impact that an individual developer can have has never been greater than today. The opportunity to streamline your workflow, even if it's just by shaving milliseconds off of the time that it takes you to write a function, has tremendous multiplicative impact, which is why we do what we do. <clears throat> That's why we really spend a lot of time to ensure that you guys have a, the most productive experience with your tools. Our mission with Visual Studio is to provide the best in class tools that will enable any developer, period. That is our goal. With VS Code, we now have tools that can be used by developers looking for a lightweight editor on both Windows and Mac and Linux. <clears throat> and with Visual Studio Team Services, we have a comprehensive suite of developer services that enable a full application lifecycle management suite. So that includes things like source code control and bug and work item tracking, continuous integration, load testing, crash analytics, beta testing, release management, package management. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And you guys <laughs> don't even know how many things we have planned for the Visual Studio Team Services uh, product. <clears throat> it's pretty exciting. Today, I'm going to focus this session mainly on the Visual Studio IDE, which is an immersive developer experience that's tailor-made for your development needs. Now, Visual Studio is the most popular developer IDE in the world. With 2015, we've seen over 12.7 million downloads thus far since it launched last July. And we have over 6,000 extensions in the gallery for the VS IDE. And we're adding extensions at a rate of about 100 per month. So that really allows you guys to have the confidence that no matter what you need to build, there's going to be an extension for it. Maybe something that will make you just a little bit more productive. And we've also seen you guys use them. 
We have over 950,000 extension downloads per month. So you guys are definitely using the extensions that are in our gallery. How many, how many of you guys have never used an extension before? One guy. All right, somebody, somebody, <laughs> go talk to that guy. <laughs> Check it out. I think you'll find something you like. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you guys new bits today, and that's an understatement. <laughs> the bits I've got on the two boxes here, so on this, on this uh, Lenovo and on this Surface Book, <clears throat> have a combination of Visual Studio 2015 Update 2, which is available today. You guys should go download it. Um, Visual Studio 15 Preview, uh, which is also available today. And it's actually available in two ways, and I'd like you guys to try out both of those ways, and I'll talk about that. I also have, <clears throat> this is a little, makes me a little uncomfortable. I have 10 private patches <laughs> on these two machines, <laughs> uh, five of which were made public today, but were private when I got them. <laughs> and one of which was patched this morning <laughs> at about 6 a.m. The developers, there were two sets of bits that were really not cooperating, and the developers had to work on it overnight to get me a, a combination of the editor bits and the Roslyn bits that worked well together. <clears throat> so crossing my fingers, everything works. <laughs> um, but these bits are hot, hot, hot. So. <laughs> Forgive me if things fail a little bit on stage. I generally know some workarounds. Uh, but if they don't, you know, that's the risk that I take because I want to show you guys really what is coming for you soon. <clears throat> I'll also show you guys at least 10, I mean, I haven't even counted, but I know that I have at least 10 new features that I'm going to be show you, showing you guys that have never been surfaced at any kind of conference like this before. <clears throat> and at the end, I really want to focus on a behind-the-scenes demo, um, which literally takes uh, me logging into the Redmond domain to be able to show it to you guys live, uh, because it's our infrastructure. And I want to show you guys how important it is um, that we get feedback from you, uh, because it helps us improve the product. So I want to show you how, how we actually do that. Now. <clears throat> What I'm going to do next is talk about our new acquisition experience. So let me just bring that up real quick. So what you see here is the new lightweight installer. And if you see at the bottom of the screen that aka.msvsnext, you guys can get that now. Uh, you can go to that URL and go get it. If you look on that page, there's actually two different uh, installers of Visual Studio. This is the one on the right. <laughs> so one of the things that you'll notice here is that not all of the workloads uh, are available. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and click Install. Well, excuse me while I agree to admin escalation. <clears throat> now, you guys have probably never seen Visual Studio set up during a demo. This is a 60-minute session, right? <laughs> Let's see what we can do. <laughs> no, really, I want you guys to see for yourselves just how quickly it'll be. Now that Visual Studio truly provides tools for any developer building any kind of app, it also means that the size of the installation, if you install everything, has gotten a little bit large. 75% <clears throat> of our users install the default, whatever we kind of put in the default which includes a few Windows platforms and also the web platform. But most users of Visual Studio don't target all of those workloads. So we set out in this next version to make the installation experience really lightweight. It installs in megabytes, not gigabytes, minutes, not hours, and it's the same IDE that you know and love, just faster and lighter. It's lighter. The base downloads in less than 300 megabytes. It installs in less than 500 megabytes on disk, and we continue to work on that to improve it by the time we ship. It's fast. The average install time is 180 seconds, and I'm being quite generous with that. It also is optimized for you. It allows you to see what you're going to be able to install, and it also makes it so that you don't have to make that decision once, and you don't know how to get back to the setup screen again. <laughs> It's actually something that's very easy to kind of, you know, configure and reconfigure if you want to. It's also low impact. 
the core shell is isolated. It doesn't touch the machine-wide DAC or registry, and it installs side-by-side -side with Via Visual Studio 2015 as well as the larger Visual Studio 15 installer. Side-by-side, -side, no impact. Now, this is a preview, so we expect to have agile releases. It doesn't include all of the workloads today, but we will update it regularly with new builds as new workloads come online. And we're done. That's the best one-click demo I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so by the time we ship, you guys will see, we only have a couple of workloads enabled so far. But by the time we ship, we really expect to be able to have all of the workloads available in this kind of context. <clears throat> Now let's go see what we can do with it. So I'm just going to launch it here. It's coming up on my other screen, so let me just bring that up. I'm going to sign in later, and we'll make this blue. And again, it's coming up on my other screen, but I will just bring it over for you guys to see. Now that looks like the Visual Studio you guys all know and love, hopefully. Is that what you were expecting to see? So what I'm going to do, I've, I've downloaded a couple of different projects from GitHub, and I have them on my disk. One of the new capabilities that we have is the ability to open a folder. So what you'll see here is that I'm going to just go ahead and open on my desktop these Hikunator surveys and select the folder. And you can see that that opens. And I have a Hikunator Go, a Hikunator Python, and a Hikunator Ruby version here. Now I can go ahead and inspect the Hikunator Go instance. And you can see that we have all of the colorization, syntax highlighting, all of the kind of stuff that you would expect to see. Now let's go ahead and look at the, I can barely see this from here, uh, look at the Hikonator PHP version. And you can see that we get a similar kind of syntax highlighting. And lastly, I'm going to look at Hikonator Ruby. And again, we get sim similar syntax highlighting. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is just go ahead and show you guys what happens when I do something like def and enter. You can actually see that we get some amount of kind of statement completion and pretty printing going on in here as well. And that's what happens with the minimum install. So I've basically installed none of the runtimes or any of the kind of you know, library dependencies that you might have for these things, but I can at least browse and look at source. Now, I can go back to the Hikonator Go instance, and just go ahead and do control comma to look for Hikunate, oops, and you guys can see that this actually searches across all of the different uh, files that I've opened with this folder. So you can see that it shows the Hikunate PHP, it shows the Hikunate uh, Ruby. I can go ahead and select something like that and navigate to it. So I actually get some pretty basic navigation with this min installer after installing only two minutes. Pretty cool? All right, so now what I'm going to do, let's just uh, tab back here. So if I just went ahead and installed the Python, installer here. I'm not going to do that right now because this one takes about six minutes and I think that might be a little bit slow for a demo. Um, instead, I'm going to switch to my other machine that already has the Python bits already installed. So let's go to six. There we go. And I have this Hikonator Pi folder as you see here. Now I'm just going to go to the Visual Studio 15 preview. And I'm going to open that, use that same feature to open the folder. 
Now this already has the Python tools for VS tool, uh, tools installed. I'm going to go to the desktop, open Hikinator Pi, go ahead and select that folder. And we can see that I have Hikinator here and I have Hikinator Pi defined. I can open that, hopefully. Come on. There we go. Um, so you guys can see most of the code is down below, but I already have all of the syntax highlighting and other things like that that you would expect. Now, one of the really cool things about the open folder feature is that not only can I download source and start browsing it to understand it, but I also can pretty easily start to configure a debug context for that as well. So what I'm going to do here is just go ahead and define a startup file. Um, now this one was, oops, that's the wrong place. Let me just delete that. Now this one was designed as a library, so I really need to, uh, I need to define a new startup file to invoke it. I'm just going to create startup.py, and in this case I'm going to say import hikernator, and you can see that we have statement completion going on right here, name equals, uh, Hikernator.hikernate, and I'm going to say print name. Okay. So then I'm just going to go ahead and say this is this is going to be my startup item. Now I have a little bit of a bug that we that we still have to fix. That I just have to go ahead and edit this so that it actually gets start started up. But this will be fixed by the time we ship. And I'm just going to set the Python interpreter to the location of my Python interpreter, which is C colon backslash Python 27 Python dot exe. And I need another backslash. And just save. <clears throat> Interpreter. Thank you so much. Did I get that right now? Yes, hopefully. Okay, now I can go back into the Hikinator Pi and I could go ahead and do something like set a breakpoint and hit F5. And we can actually see that the breakpoint is hit. So, really, all I've done at this point is I've downloaded some source off of GitHub, I've brought that into my local I brought that onto my local disk, and I've opened that folder. I installed the Python tools so that I actually had the Python interpreter running locally, um, and then I just set up start, startup script, and I can all of a sudden start to debug, which is pretty awesome. Just imagine being able to travel around the internet looking for source and being able to view it immediately. That's kind of one of the things that's cool about the projects like Hikinator or like uh, To Do MVC is it's a really nice uh, quick comparison. Okay, uh, let's just go back to the slides. So I just showed you guys how with the minimum installer you can get a pretty great experience to browse and learn about code and how you can open a folder even when the code hasn't been created using Visual Studio. So you can quickly learn about that code. We will continue to fill out all of the different scenarios so that we have really truly have tools for any developer building any kind of app. Now I'm going to show you yet another instance of that just right now. And we announced this a little bit earlier today, um, but I'm going to show you something that has not actually been demoed yet. <clears throat> so let's go back to the demo machine. And we will just uh, stop debugging here. And what I'm going to show you here is I have an instance of Ubuntu running locally. Now, apologies for the small resolution. It won't actually matter for the demo. Uh, this is not 
you know, what was talked about in the keynote. This is not a locally running version of Ubuntu within Windows. This is truly Ubuntu running as a VM, and I'm connected via Hyper-V. Um, so that's what I'm showing you guys here. Now, the next thing that I'm going to show you is a new extension that we announced today for C++, which allows you to build a Linux project. Now, this is available on update two, and I can go ahead and select uh, Linux here, and you can see that we have templates for Blink, so this is basically a Blink LED uh, using Raspberry Pi, if you want to build it that way. We also have a console application and an empty project, if that's what you want to do. Um, in this case, I have an OpenGL project. So what I'm going to do is I already have this OpenGL project open, and I'm just going to kind of make this so that you can see it side by side with that Ubuntu build. And let's just make the Solution Explorer a little smaller. And if everything is working as expected, I can actually go ahead and launch the debugger. And after this builds, uh-oh. OK, well, let me show you guys really quickly how to set up. The, it looks like my uh, IP address might have changed, and these things happen. So let me just show you guys. 10, 5, 2, 2, 4, no longer 2, 2, 3. So I can go into Tools Options. I can go down to Cross-Platform C++, go to Linux, and go to the Connection Manager. It's no longer 2, 2, 3. I can remove that and add one that is 10.5.100.224. And my username is Amanda. Ten dot five. Oh, nope, wrong one. Sorry, let me scroll up. Yeah, it's ten dot five dot one hundred dot two two four. Let's see. What did I forget? What do you think? Nope. Ten dot five dot one two seven. There, that's what I'm missing. No, 100. This was working right before this. Yes, it is. Ten dot five dot one hundred. Okay, if this doesn't work, then we might be skipping this demo. That would be too sad. Ten dot five dot one hundred. Ten dot five dot one hundred. Dot 224, connect. Ah, kills me. Okay, uh, let's try that one more time. Be really careful on the password. Ah, uh, this was so cool. Okay, maybe I will come back to this at the end, but let me get through the rest of the demo instead. Am I still connected? Hmm. Okay. Well, <laughs> we will instead go back to slides. That's too sad. Okay, what I was going to show you guys was an OpenGL cube spinning on the Ubuntu uh, container. Unfortunately, that just didn't, didn't quite turn out the way that I had hoped. Um, now, everybody was really excited about the Windows Ubuntu announcement this morning. And after the SQL announcement a couple of weeks ago, uh, Balmer actually called Satya and told him that he loved the announcement. I just love that story. <laughs> so as you guys unfortunately didn't quite see, but we, 
you d at least saw the template, um, we have more evidence that we're continuing to work on tools for any developer building any kind of application with Visual Studio. So we'll continue to work on any developer building any kind of app so that you guys can break into new territory and do what your business really needs you guys to do. But we know that what matters to you most is the workloads that you target, whatever they are today, and your productivity for targeting those workloads. So let's talk about our vision for the developer in your loop a little bit. With edit, we really want to make sure that you can edit and update your code without having to lift your fingers from the keyboard. That's really kind of how we think about the, the problem space. So everything that we do, even if it is a graphical experience, we absolutely need to have hotkeys that make sense and all of that kind of stuff, and that it's consistent. It's really important that we have consistency even as you travel in between languages uh, when that makes sense. <laughs> We also want to make sure that you can learn about the code that you need to write in context, in situ. And I'll show you guys a little bit about that in a minute. With compile, we know that compile times are really the difference between you staying in this mentally in the zone and go, taking a water cooler break, right? So to us, we really kind of want to make sure that you can compile quickly. And that's why we've invested so much in incremental and background compile for C Sharp. And for JavaScript, TypeScript, and Python, other kinds of interpreted languages, uh, we really want to make sure that you can navigate seamlessly between the runtime environment that's really kind of running live and the ed code editing experience that you have. We've also worked on really improving the compilation throughput for the C++ compiler. Link time in 2015, Visual Studio 2015, has actually improved by 2 to 3x. How many of you guys are experiencing that today? Have any, has anybody noticed the performance improvements? Okay, for those of you who are watching on the, on the screen, everyone raised their hands. <laughs> <laughs> but just in terms of our own experience, for the Connect Sports Rival game, which is one of the games that we work on in Microsoft Studios, um, that went from 620 seconds for build to 68 seconds. So that's, a, that's 10 minutes to one minute. So we've actually personally seen these kinds of improvements. And we also want to make sure that you guys are seeing these kinds of improvements as well. So if you have feedback, definitely give it to us. With diagnostics, we want your experience to derive from your source. So in the next room over, they're talking a little bit about diagnostics. Um, you know, we've introduced perf tips uh, and, to, and show you guys data in context, in the context of your source, so that you guys can navigate to the CPU profiler tools directly from the editor. We also think about test and diagnostics as part of the same cycle. So when you're writing your tests, you're hopefully live debugging pretty much at the same time as you're authoring them. So let me just show you guys another demo kind of focused on productivity. <laughs> All right, so I, will, I won't shut the Ubuntu down, just in case we can get back to it a little bit later. Um, but what I'm going to do first is go back to that C++ instance, that C++ project of OpenGL. I shouldn't have closed that, but we can go ahead and open that OpenGL project. Now, one of the things that I can do here how many of you guys have heard of the, uh, the experimental editor features in the C++ editor? Not very many. Uh, so one of the nice things that I can do is just go ahead and select that and then do control dot. And you can see that without having to lift my, my, key, my fingers from the keyboard, I can go ahead and extract a function. Oops, I selected too much. Okay, things are going well today. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and select this instead. And for this one, again, I will bring this up. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. I will select that and surround it with parens. So that's just an example of the kinds of experimental features that we have in the editor. But the goal here is that your experience continues to get better in the context of the editor without you having to lift the keyboard. 
Now the next thing I'm going to do is to open the Haiku, same Haikunator project, but in the context of C Sharp. So I will take the 2015 preview, open Haikunator solution file. Ignore that. That just shows you guys that I really did download that from GitHub. OK. So now we can go ahead and look at the Hikonator file. And we can scroll down a little bit just so you can see it. Now what this Hikonate project does is it just comes up with a random name that sounds like a haiku. Um, that's what it does in every single language. So uh, you know the, the adjectives and the nouns above are just, I guess, zen-like uh, zen names for the haiku names. Um, but then below is basically the algorithm for how you combine these things and a random number seed. And that's what it does across each one of the different languages. Now, because this is a .NET project, obviously this one comes with tests because .NET developers do things completely, which is nice. Um, so if we go to the Hikonate tests, uh, I can scroll down and look at some of these tests. And I can see that there are some things that I don't really like about the way that these things are created, such as test single word isn't quite using the casing that I'd like. So one of the things that I can do is go to the tools options and go to the text editor, C sharp. And we now have code style rules, which is nice, yes. So I can go ahead and add a naming rule. I will call it uh, Pascal Cased Methods. And I will choose, in this case, a property and method to apply it to. And I will apply Pascal Case. There's no parent rule, but I will make this one an error. And I will just go ahead and apply this. And we can see that after the background compiler, thank you, after the background compiler kicks in, this comes up, and I can actually go ahead and see how uh, the automatic correction will come up and change that for me. I can even go ahead and preview the changes, and we can see that it will change the casing of that and apply it. Cool? Yes. Um, so next, I'm going to go to line 41. OK. And we can see that what I don't like here is that that's all on the same line. So let me just close this a little bit so you guys can see. This is all on the same line, which isn't, isn't quite my, my aesthetics for code. So I can go ahead and go back into the tools options. And in this case, what I want to do is go to formatting. And I'm going to go to new lines. And in this case, I didn't have a new line formatting for place, place open brace on new line for methods. So here you can see that that's what it's like when I don't have that rule on, and this is what it's like when I do have that rule on. So now we can again go ahead and try to create a new method. Public void test. And we can see that it actually does the, the formatting the way that I would expect to. Of course, I made a typo which is great. Um, now, the next thing I'm going to do is go to line 48. And you can see that we have the this called here for an instance variable, which isn't quite the way that I like to do things. So I can go ahead and go into the tools options again. And in this case, I'm going to go to general. And rather than prefer this, I'm going to say do not prefer this. And if I just go ahead and get this recompiled, this should turn into an error. And we can see that this show potential fixes. Let's just scroll over so you guys can actually see that a little bit better. I can bring that up again. I can change the this qualification. And this is an instance of uh, the kind of style rule that I can apply not just for this document, but also for the entire project or other files in the solution. 
So I can go ahead and just uh, preview changes, and in this case, I want to apply it to this particular document, and you can see that it automatically changes. Now, all of that is also accessible with hotkeys. Um, now, the next thing I'm going to do is to go to line 48. And we can see uh, test drops token. Uh, that's what I was just talking about. Great. And then let's go to line 88. Okay. So now we can see this, this is match. Um, so I'm going to go to, again, to tools options, to the code style rules, again to the general, and I'm going to say for built-in types, uh, we are going to prefer an explicit type, just to show you guys this, that this can all be applied, and we're going to make all of these errors. Oh, that, that already was applied, so let me go back and just change that back to prefer var. That's what I meant. Forgot to toggle that before this. And we can see that that actually comes up, and it allows me, again, to show potential fixes. Again, I can actually apply this to the entire document or to the project or the solution. I can preview the changes and go ahead and switch that to a var, and it does it directly in line. So we now have st code style rules, which hopefully is something you guys have been looking for for a while. Now the next thing I'm going to do is show you guys a little bit about how you can locate, search, navigate, and debug your dependencies for code you want to write as easily as your own code. Now this is the most risky demo. I thought the C++ demo was a little bit risky and then this one came along, so uh, we're, we're going to go for it. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to open just another instance of the Visual Studio 15 preview. And in this case, I'm going to, this is because I really want this to be isolated. <laughs> uh, I'm going to choose a console application. OK, so I told you guys that I have a whole bunch of unique bits, private bits um, installed on these particular machines. Now, one of the first things that we have is uh, the Bing uh, developer assistant. So you can see that here at the top of the completion list, I have a how do I. Um, and I can invoke that to actually go ahead and use Bing to search for code on the internet. And I can go ahead and say uh, convert XML to JSON. And I will go ahead and find that and copy it. So that looks like what I want. And I will paste it right here. OK. So now, that gets compiled pretty quickly. And then I can, again, bring up control dot to bring up the fixes. So this is just saying I need to have a using system.xml. Fantastic. OK, here's another one. Now, this one, this error, is that the name JSON convert does not exist in the current context. And again, I'm going to bring up the control dot to bring up fixes. In addition to all of the fixes that I had previously, this one is a problem where I actually haven't added the reference. Uh, and so, you know, because it doesn't know that I need that reference, a lot of the fixes that we've suggested in the past have been to generate a property or something like that. It kind of assumes that you're doing test-driven development. Um, and so it has a pattern for how you can fix it, assuming that you have test-driven development. One of the new features that we have uh, in this private build that I have, but is coming for Visual Studio 15, is I can go ahead and select using newton.jsonsoft and actually find and install the latest version. So this is actually going to NuGet. It's actually looking for JSON, JSON convert and actually installing that NuGet package directly into my code. I didn't need to go to any add reference or anything like that, any kind of dialogue. I could do that directly from the editor. Cool. So that would be cool enough that I would be willing to risk my machine to get you know, uh, bits 
at 6 a.m. this morning from these guys. Um, but uh, let me just go back and change the tools option here because I'm noticing that that's not doing something that I want it to do right now. Code style. And we will not make these errors anymore. OK. That should go away in a second. Um, so now the next thing I'm going to do is actually attempt to understand what is this serialized XML node thing. Let me just go ahead and do that so that it gets committed. Great. And I'm going to just hit F12 on that. Now what this is doing is it's actually going to the source location of the JSON convert. Pretty, I think that's pretty cool. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But this is actually going to the source location and bringing it into Visual Studio. So I can actually go ahead and scroll down and look at this stuff and look at all of this code that's here to understand it. So now, I'm going to just hit a set a breakpoint here and start running it. Uh oh. That's not good. Let's try this one more time. Wow, the demo gods are loving me today. Let's just do this one more time. Touch pads. Go ahead and copy paste it. That's the nice thing about this is it's really easy to re recreate. And I can just apply that one more time using system.xml and apply that one more time to find and install the latest version. And we can see that that's working. And then we can go ahead and go again to the json.convert. Do I get applause this time? <laughs> It works successfully, so that means that the bits are actually uh, working together. OK, great. So now let's go ahead and debug it. Oh my god. Wow. OK, let's go to the uh, properties. There's Solution Explorer. Go to Project Properties. Console Application. Startup object. There we go. OK. Hopefully that'll work this time. Oh my gosh. Great. That's pretty fantastic. Well, fortunately, that wasn't the, uh, the most salient part of the demo. Um, the thing that actually is kind of interesting is that in addition to being able to look into the source code that's defined on JSON uh, in the JSON project, I can go ahead and look at formatting here. Um, and I can even do something like find all references. And you can see that the find all references is actually showing me results from GitHub projects directly in Visual Studio. OK, so then what I would have discovered in that process is that I needed to add a formatting dot indented. And that would have fixed the formatting style that I wanted. But we're not going to do that right now. OK. Now let's go back to this test Haikunate project. Now let's talk for a minute about uh, diagnostics and test scenarios. <clears throat> and let's go to the Solution Explorer. Now, one of the things that we actually added in update one uh, that we haven't really talked about very much uh, is the fact that we now have a C-sharp REPL. It's pretty great. Uh, now, I noticed, 
I noticed this morning, uh, as people were discussing hack Hacker News Update 2, people were surprised to hear that we actually could uh, initialize the project, the interactive window, uh, with this project. So I'm actually going to right click on the project and initialize it with the test solution, which is pretty useful. OK. So next thing I'm going to do is show you guys uh, yet another addition for our statement completion. And I'm showing you guys this in the context of the interactive window, again, because I have so many different private bits that are uh, I'm trying to get to work at the same time. Um, but I'm just going to do completion here. Now let me, let me do that again a little bit higher so that everybody can see that. Again, I'm going to do completion. Now, what this is showing me is the statement completion list. But it, as you see at the bottom, there are additional glyphs at the bottom of the statement completion list. When I bring up the statement completion list in the default context in a WPF project, there are 2,004 members in that default list. When you're trying to learn about code, it's really hard to scroll 2,004 members and kind of understand what all of those things are and what you, what you might want to use. So one of the cool things about this is if I mouse over, you can see that I can look at just the properties that are available in this scope, or just the events. And all of this I can do with just the uh, keystrokes. So in this case, I want to see, I want to see, uh, I could see, for example, the interfaces and the classes. And I can, I can not only look at the interfaces and then, or the classes, but I can also multi-select and I can actually look at both of those things at the same time, which is pretty cool. And all of this is available via hotkeys. Now the next thing I'm going to show you guys is that we also have, uh, we also have case, like, um, not case matching, uh, substring matching. So that if I, I want to look at, for example, all of the attributes that are available in the namespace, I can actually go ahead and see that as well. Oops, let's see. So now I'm going to show you guys uh, var tests. I'm going to just initialize this, new hyphenator tests. There we go. And I'm going to show you guys tests.th. So in addition to having substring matching, we also have camel case matching. So that if you really want to look at something that is, you know, you just remember what the, what the top keys are, you can also do that as well, which is great. So next thing I'm going to do is just uh, test a new function that I call susanate instead of hyphenate. Oh, and I forgot to say tests.setup. And again, and we will scroll down just so that everybody can see this. Tests.susanate. And if I do that without the semicolon, it will return to the interactive window. Marvelous Wenzler. Great. <laughs> so that just shows you guys how we have both kind of code editing and testing and a debug context kind of all running in the same environment uh, with the interactive window. OK. So now I'm just going to go back to slides really quick. Seven. So I, show, I talked about edit and diagnose and compile and test. Our vision of the developer inner loop also includes commit as a core part of it. Uh, now, you guys might be surprised to learn that Git is the most popular source code control system within Visual Studio over TFVC. Uh, and in fact, actually, this might explain it. Two-thirds of our users in Visual Studio use more than one version control system. 
So it's fairly common for people to use both Git and TFVC uh, together. But we also, in terms of repositories, have folks who are on VSTS as well as GitHub and Bitbucket. Now, new to Visual Studio 2015 Update 2 and coming very, very soon to Visual Studio 15 uh, in a few weeks, but I'm going to show you guys the private bits now. Uh, we will have commit as a core part of your developer inner loop. So let me just go ahead and show you guys that. Let's go back to this project again. Slide six, I mean, number six, let's just close this. And what you guys can see here is that, that down here in the task panel, we can go ahead and publish this to Git. This is very small, I apologize, but I can go ahead and publish this to Git. And in the Team Explorer, we can see that that comes up, that I can say, uh, get started. And I'm just going to go ahead and say, this is Hikinator CS. I'm going to log in with my own uh, GitHub repo credentials. And I'm going to uh, publish it directly to GitHub in this case. Now, we've been working with the folks at GitHub. This is uh, based on an extension that they've actually provided. Uh, and I got these bits on Monday. So. <laughs> Cool. So now what you see here is that at the bottom, I also have the branches um, as well as the project that I have defined for this project. So I can go ahead and say uh, branches. And obviously what I just checked in was a new master branch. I can create a new branch. And in this case, I want to call it a feature branch. And I'm going to go ahead and create the branch and check it out. And now I'm going to add a new function. Let me just open this up, open up a, so I, you don't have to see me type. And I'm going to add a new function for test Jabberwocky. And we can go ahead and do that. And I'm going to save that. So now what you see is at the bottom, in, again, in the uh, task panel, if you look very closely, we have this little one. And that defines the number of commits that I've done since I checked out from the branch. So now I can add a, connect, add a commit message and say add Jabberwocky and say commit all, added test. And then that was all of the edits since the last checkout. I can also see how many unpublished commits I have. So I can go ahead and look at the unpublished commits. I can directly go and fetch that. And then I can publish the new commits that I have. So now we can go to my project. And we can go to, let's see, uh, let's re reload this. We can see Hikinator CS was just loaded. And we can see that I actually have a new pull request in GitHub. And I can go ahead and do all of the workflow that I would in, work in GitHub to actually accept that pull request. Now, we don't have the pull request workflow in Visual Studio yet, but we are working on that. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting. So with Update 2 and Visual Studio 15, we now have an integrated lightweight experience for source code control, which supports a rich commit history um, that works with basically all of the popular community repos. So you're not losing any of your history as you use these Visual Studio features here. OK, so the last thing I wanted to do is to, I, I talked to you guys a lot about brand spanking new functionality in Visual Studio, most of which worked. Uh, but one of the most important ways that we know that we're on the right track in terms of enabling new scenarios or new features or maintaining the quality and reliability that you guys expect from Visual Studio um, is by getting feedback directly from you. And there's a few ways that you guys can provide feedback to us. The first is by clicking the little glyph right next to the quick launch menu in Visual Studio. I'll show you guys this in a minute. And that allows you to report a problem or to provide a suggestion. 
The second is by answering surveys or participating in forums or even tweeting to us. We actually read all of that stuff and we respond to all of that stuff. Let me show you guys something in the product right now that should make this a little bit easier. So I'm just going to jump back to Visual Studio here. And rather than do this in Visual Studio 15, because it doesn't quite have as much results, I'm going to show you guys the, uh, this experience in Visual Studio 2015 Update 2. So what you can see here is there's that little glyph at the top that allows you to send feedback and report a problem. Now, one of the new experiences in Update 2 is that you can actually see trending issues. <laughs> so the cool thing about this is I can do something like uh, look for a form, and I can see all of the trending issues that relate to a form, which is cool. That means that I can very easily plus one an issue that's been reported. Very nice. So that's one experience. Let's jump back to this for a second. Um, now this is, you know, again, that same thing. I'm just going to kind of make that larger. You guys can see that this edit and continue error crashes in Visual Studio 2015 Update 2 RC, and it has 11 votes. Um, if you see below it, it says Visual Studio is hung, <clears throat> and that had nine votes at the time that I took this screen scrape. So, when it comes to performance, it's not always that easy to correlate what you guys say verbatim and what we end up seeing in the product. For example, the last thing that I showed you guys had Visual Studio hung by typing with nine votes. That could be a single issue or that could be many, many issues. So we've done some investments over the past release to make sure that we can continuously improve your experience. And I just want to show you guys a quick behind the scenes for how that works. So I'm just going to bring up this right here. Now again, this required that I logged into the Redmond domain. Um, so this is actually real data from our real customers, uh, you guys. <laughs> and this is showing external data. Now we have a tool called Watson. Watson is basically the tool that we used whenever Visual Studio crashes or any Microsoft product crashes. Uh, that basically brings it in. Elementary is the tool that we use to make sense of that, uh, to actually look at all of the evidence and say this is what, this is what it leads us to. So what you can see here is um, this particular thing is a, something called Perf Watson. I'm looking for all of the issues that are Perf Watsons which means that there are UI delays that lasted more than one second in the Visual Studio Editor. Now, if I click on this second one here, you can see that this is an F do idle. And what we do is we can actually go ahead and look at subsequent uh, reports, subsequent queries from later releases to see that we actually address the issue. Now, in addition to actually getting all of these uh, dumps and traces, we also have reports from you guys uh, that come into us that can be correlated with these things. So let me just uh, scroll in a little bit, make this a little larger. You can see that I can, this one is right click context menu. Now this guy is actually showing his picture and his identifier because he's actually a Microsoft employee. Um, for all of you guys, it's absolutely anonymized. We can't see any of the information about who actually sent us all of that data, but this one is from an internal person. Um, and because he provided a very deep, you know, good stack trace and dump, we could actually go ahead and fix this, and we did in, in update two. Uh, this should work. If not, I will jump to this one. And Ah, that just reloaded. Now this is one from an external customer um, that was talking about a crash in association with the process for the tools for Apache Cordova. Now again, when, when this person reported it, they provided uh, a little bit of, of repo history, uh, repro history so that we could recreate it. Now this last one is really interesting. This one was Visual Studio 2015 Hangs. Now this guy is saying, I can't figure out why 
But while in a universal app project, the .NET IDE suddenly hangs. I've let Windows collect all of the information without canceling the process, so hopefully you'll have more info soon. But I don't know how you'll associate it with the actual problem I've been having. This has happened now twice in the last 24 hours. Now, one of the benefits of reporting your experience through the tool in the IDE is that we actually collect uh, traces and you know, dumps from you guys, including if you're having a performance problem, we can actually see what's happening on the machine. And for this particular instance, even though this guy had no idea how to repro this, we could actually go back, look at the, look at the dumps from what he had uploaded in when he uploaded the VS feedback, and correlate it, and we actually fixed this problem with update two. So I just wanted to share that with you because I think it's really important that you guys understand how we use your feedback um, to continuously improve the product. And let me go back to this. Okay. So I've shown you guys a little bit of a glimpse of the future of Visual Studio. Your next Visual Studio will have a lightweight install, which is optimized for your needs. It will allow you to develop for any app, whatever you guys want, whatever your heart desires. It will allow you to be the most productive tooling experience, have the most productive tooling experience in the industry. And with your feedback, it will continuously improve. We're just getting started, so please download the new bits. Um, again, there are two ways to do that. Download the large installer or the, uh, or the lightweight installer and give us feedback on that. Thank you guys for using Visual Studio. Thanks for joining us at Build. If you want to get any more details on what I talked about today, here are some sessions you can look at, and I'm happy to take uh, questions.